is the screen working, like the sharing? OK, good. Thank you. OK, uh, well, thanks for uh, inviting the paper, uh, Tony and Sri, for co-organizing. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Valentin and Paul. And uh, the Fed, uh, usual Fed disclaimer applies. And also, I want to thank Gil for uh, working as a reader and uh, moderator. OK, so the starting point of the paper, uh, Bubbles and the Value of Innovation, uh, is really uh, the observation that, uh, sorry, that uh, innovation uh, or, or specul sorry, speculation on uh, financial markets go hand in hand with like uh, uh, innovation. And on one side, so like makes sense, uh, innovation is founded and traded on uh, financial markets. So really uh, asset prices are uh, important to understand uh, uh, innovation or affect innovation. That's something that we see, for example, uh, in uh, recent papers by Bloom, Shankerman and Von Riener, or uh, Kogan et al, that really think about how asset prices can be uh, a measure of private and social value of, of innovation. Uh, there is another side to this that's not only like financial markets that help us understand innovation, but that really remarking that these periods of high entry and innovation, really when we have lots of ideas going around, lots of firms being created, uh, really coincide with intense speculation on markets. And, and Jose Schankman, in uh, one of his recent books on, on bubbles, like gives plenty of examples of this, like railroads going uh, way back, or electricity, automobile, radio, uh, microelectronics, biotech, and, and nowadays the, the internet. So this is really sort of like this tight link between those two uh, phenomena that, that we like to uh, uh, think about. And we want to think about this in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, so first, how does speculation affect innovation at very so like basic uh, level? Uh, second, like during bubbles, during times of speculation, can we actually make sense of asset prices to tell us something about the effect of innovation? Or are just prices worthless uh, uh, in terms of innovation? And indeed, we'll tell you that, yeah, we can use prices, uh, provided we do it the right way. And last, and that's really so, sort of doing a, a joint hypothesis here, is that can we use the price of innovation to tell us a little bit about how bubbles work? Like, can we put some structure on, on uh, some kinds of bubbles here? Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, uh, first, you know, uh, we are gonna uh, build a theory of uh, in the interaction of speculation of and innovation. So, you know, agents are gonna have internal beliefs about uh, which uh, projects or firms are more likely to succeed. Uh, coupled with short sale constraint, well, that's going to be a primary source of bubble in the model. You know, to think about the uh, firm side and, and sort of like the role of innovation and, and how innovation is valuable to the economy, we're going to incorporate a rich set of spillover across firms, like everything that, that pertains to firm interaction. So examples of such spillovers could be competition spillovers, also known as business stealing, uh, Firms learn from one another, so that known as knowledge spillover. It could also be a popularity effect, uh, so like the labor generated by uh, a new firm entry or such thing as demand externality or pecuniary externalities. And in, in this framework, well, what we're going to look at, well, we're going to see how the private and the social value of innovation, something I'll, I'll clarify a little bit, actually change during bubbles. Okay, so we're going to see how the measurement, the, the common measurement that we do when we measure the value of innovation, change can change uh, uh, in bubbles. And what we'll find that, you know, whether you measure uh, the value of innovation using asset prices or um, using real outcomes uh, is going to be quite different. Okay, in terms of results, well, first, we're going to see that, uh, uh, as I said, that the first finding is that when there is speculation on financial markets, we're gonna see more innovation. Okay, so bubbles indeed go hand in hand with uh, uh, innovation. And you know, as investors tend to disagree about which project uh, is going to uh, uh, succeed, well, they all put all of their money, or like they all invest in their favorite project leading to so like higher uh, uh, prices and eventually more entry, more firms uh, get started here. Okay, so that's the start of a bubble, like the, the crash, what really makes this bubble a bubble, that there's going to be a subsequent crash. Of course, not all of these firms can be successful ex post. Not everybody can be right about finding 
the next uh, Google or, or Facebook, and we're gonna have this sort of like crash exposed once outcome are realized. Okay, and so what's interesting here is that actually the market value associated with new patents, the market value that we saw like during the, the high valuation period is going to increase relative to their ultimate impact, which is sort of like the number of uh, patents that we're going to see. Okay, the uh, uh, second thing that we're going to, to see is that how the speculation is going to affect uh, spillovers, right? So how is it going to affect how we perceive those spillovers? If you think that uh, the first type of spillover I, I talked about, which is competitive spillover, the fact that you know, uh, a new firm is going to sort of like steal market share from you, well, this effect is going to be dampened once uh, uh, if I look at market-based uh, measure of this spillover. Why is that? Well, if we are all sure of picking winners, well, let's worry about this competition. If I know that for sure I'm the winner, why should I care so much about uh, new firms entry uh, uh, stealing my market shares? Okay, so that's like uh, uh, one way where we're gonna see that speculation does actually affect significantly uh, how we measure uh, these uh, spillover. Okay, so we're gonna actually look at more than uh, this uh, specific type of competition spillover, I'm gonna uh, tell you that speculation distorts uh, all, uh, distorts other kinds of, of spillovers. So one spillover I mentioned is that when firms uh, enter, they're gonna actually create jobs, uh, that they do not internalize the fact that they create those jobs. So that's actually a positive uh, a spillover. But of course, you know, we can't really speculate on these jobs. They're not really affected by the speculation. So these are not going to be uh, similarly impacted by speculation. Then there is another family of spillovers, general equilibrium spillovers I'll talk uh, briefly on. And these are all, they affect all the firms the same way. So they're not going to be affected by spillover. That's something that I explained towards the end of the talk. One of the takeaways is going to be that there are going to be drastic differences uh, in the social value of innovation, depending whether you are measuring innovation using prices, so financial markets, or depending whether you're measuring social value of innovation using outcomes. Outcomes could be either sales or so like the number of patents created and so forth. Okay, so what are those differences? Well, we'll see that some of the comparative statics you might be used to when you're doing, let's say, uh, innovation policy are going to be uh, turned upside down. Done. So we're going to have some like change in the sign of comparative statics. We're actually going to have change in the sign of a policy. So a policy where in one case you do a tax subsidy. Uh, now you're going to have to uh, sort of like sorry policy in which case you do like a subsidy to create more entry. While well, maybe now you're going to want to do a tax. Okay. And the last thing that I think is sort of like one of the more important that summarizes these these others is that in some cases uh, uh, when you are really only using outcomes to measure uh, spillover, you only use, you only need macro uh, elasticity. So you have sort of like the macro behavior of the economy is a sufficient statistics for thinking about the value of innovation. Now, if you think about the private value of innovation, sorry, the market-based value of innovation, now you're going to need to sort of like dig down into the details of firm interactions. And that's something that I think uh, uh, people should be aware of that, you know, when they write down a model, not uh, uh, sometimes the details of their model is going to really matter for the kind of uh, uh, measures of spillover that are going to have to think about. Okay, and then uh, I'll talk about welfare at the end, like how can we think about welfare uh, uh, in this context, and we'll focus on the welfare criterion that's basically a Pareto criterion that focus on spillovers measured using prices. So that, you know, I'm saying this upfront so that you don't think it's crazy to use prices to uh, uh, measure the spillovers. This is actually uh, uh, rationalized by uh, Pareto criterion when we think about it. Okay, so let me actually give you a small example of what we have in mind to make things a little bit more concrete. Uh, we're gonna go back to the 1690s, so end of the 17th century. On the left here, we have uh, William Phipps, who is an explorer and actually has an idea of like a treasure hunt, but he needs money to uh, uh, get there. So he's uh, raising money from a VC, the Duke of Abermarl, and then he sails to the somewhere of the coast of the Bahamas and finds a treasure, bringing a 10,000% return to uh, his VC investor. 
Okay, so that's the beginning of the story. So uh, what happens subsequently is really sort of like a, a what just described sort of like a interaction between speculation and innovation at the same time. Okay, subsequently we see that actually lots of companies uh, that want to uh, find treasures uh, in the Caribbean actually get started uh, and try to find funding uh, from VCs. This is also at the time where the uh, UK stock market, the one of the first stock market, is developing. So that's on one hand, we have sort of like this, uh, sort of like exuberant times from the UK stock market. And uh, we also have sort of like a large number of patents created for seabed exploration. Okay. Uh, it turns out that, of course, most of those explorers didn't find, only found a few cannons, didn't find a treasure. But there is really this uh, sort of like bubble features that lead to high innovation. So whether this is good or not, this is sort of like uh, a question we're, we're going to try to ask. Like if you want to bring this to like modern times, you can think of like it doesn't make a lot of sense to have all those high valuations for all those uh, tech firms that some of them might be doing the same. Okay, so let me get started with a model of business dealing with speculation. So like introduce you to the framework and, and fix some ideas. The model is uh, 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 simple in the sense that it has only two periods at time zero. Uh, firms are created, investors disagree about which firms are going to be successful. In other words, they uh, form their beliefs. Uh, and at date one, productivities are revealed and uh, firm interact. Okay, so I'm going to actually walk uh, uh, backwards uh, and start with date one, which is sort of like the simpler uh, uh, Period. At date one, production occurs, but a mass ME here of firms uh, have been created. Okay, so the mass ME of firms are all the firms inside of these circles. But what we're going to assume, we're going to assume that only a fraction of these firms get to produce. Those are also like the largest firms, this, uh, these black circles. Okay, so only the top M firms get to produce such that. Uh, you know, the production, uh, sorry, the, the output or the profit of a firm depends on its productivity, but also depends whether it is above some productivity cutoff, whether it is within the top M firms of all the firms created. Okay, so this actually introduces business stealing because if a new firm is introduced, it might actually steal a production slot from uh, existing uh, firm. Okay, so that's the setup so at time uh, one. Now at time zero, well, we're going to start with the households. Things look a little bit complicated, but actually fairly easy. Households supply some effort to produce some blueprints. Then those blueprints are sold to some firm creators. Those firm creators, you know, collect blueprints and then, you know, transfer them in viable firms on financial markets. Okay, on financial markets, then those firms are bought by the households. Uh, how do households decide how to buy those firms on financial markets? Well, they have beliefs about so like the distribution of productivity of those firms on production market, right? Household J here has believed EJ and the program of the household is going to maximize consumption today, output tomorrow by buying shares in all of the firms that exist minus the cost of effort under some uh, budget constraint and a short sale constraint. Okay, so the last thing I need to specify for you to solve the model is really to uh, find how the beliefs are determined, okay? So the first step is that, you know, all households are going to agree on the aggregate distribution of productivity, okay? So we know that how the whole economy is uh, distributed, okay? And, you know, to fix ideas, we're gonna assume that uh, the distribution of productivity is a Pareto with tail parameter gamma. Now, as I said, uh, households have actually different views on which firms are going to be uh, successful. And so they have like, they disagree about these firms and the level of disagreement actually is going to vary. And we parameterize this with the number M, okay? What does that mean? It means that households are going to form ranking about groups or packets of uh, N firms. Okay, so let me just like give you an example here. We have like many households and I'm going to focus on the number N equal four. That means that households are going to have ranking about packets of four firms. Okay, so we're going to take Alice here and Bob and Alice and Bob are going to form ranking about packets of size, uh, uh, sorry, packets of firms of size four. So here Alice is going to like 
look at the southwest quadrant there are like four firms and she's going to decide that this is the most productive firms in this group in this group this is second most third most fourth most. okay bob is going to also do the same thing but what important here is that alice and bob are sort of like iid uh, uh ranking right their ranking are not correlated so bob's going to actually have a different ranking than this uh packet of four firms and they are going to produce you know rankings about all of the packets of four firms in the economy okay so what do we get out of this well first one thing to note is that when n becomes larger disagreement increases right why well when n becomes larger it's more room to disagree right we're going to form different rankings about larger number of firms when n becomes smaller well there is more agreement right so we have less room to disagree such that when n equal one you can see that you know alice and bob are necessarily going to be agreeing on what's the most productive firms in the group of one firm. the second thing is that since Alice and Bob have beliefs on what, which firm is the most productive firms in each group, well, what's going to happen is that they are going to invest in the firm that is their favorite firm in each packet. Okay, so Alice is going to invest in here that it's first firm, first firm, first firm, and Bob too. Since the ranking are IID across households, each firm is going to have the same number of investors and the portfolio of each of the investors is going to be distributed according to the rank statistics of order n. What is that? Well, that's just the maximum uh, of n IID draws of f. I know that the population distribution is f. If I know that I'm picking the best firms among four, well, the distribution of my uh, firm is going to be f to the four. Okay. So if I know that I pick the best firm among n, the distribution of my portfolio is going to be f to the Okay, so that's how from, from their beliefs. So now we are ready to sort of like state the uh, equilibrium condition for the model. There are three markets that we're gonna clear with three first order conditions. First, blueprint creation that equalized marginal uh, cost of labor to the price of blueprints. Then the financial markets were uh, uh, from, create, sorry, from creation where basically from creators buy blueprints from the households and then sell them on financial markets and last, the uh, financial markets, the household investments, or the price of uh, a firm is going to be the expectation of its profit under uh, their favorite belief, right? So what we find is that, you know, equilibrium entry is determined by the marginal cost of effort, W prime of ME, which is going to be taken to be a, an isolistic uh, a function of, of the number of firms is going to be equal to the expected, expected profit uh, of a firm, so that's conditioning on producing expected profit of firm under the favorite distribution, under the rank statistic of other n here that we write i n. Okay, so just to give you a, a few intuitions that you know I, I prefaced in my introduction. Well, household values their own firms with i n under the rank statistic of other n, but they value the market portfolio with i one. Why is that? Well, remember the aggregate distribution is F. So if I were to buy the, the whole portfolio of all stocks in the economy, I actually know that this is the distributed F, right? Why is my portfolio more, more valuable? That's because I know that I sort of like handpicked my portfolio with all my favorite firms. So here there's already a discrepancy between sort of like the value, what I estimate to be the value of my portfolio and sort of like the value of the market portfolio. Okay, so the stock price PI really reflects the value of an optimistic, optimistic investor. Okay, the main implication is that, you know, entry, ME, is going to depend positively on the stock price. And we're going to have that both of those values, so like the valuation and uh, uh, innovation, are going to increase with disagreement and eventually crash at date one when outcomes is realized, right? Everybody bids on... Uh, those firms as if uh, the distribution was Fn, but like X plus, you know, distribution is going to be realized and be F, and so uh, prices are going to crash. Okay, so let me sort of like uh, highlight some of the features of why this is sort of like uh, the right model of bubbles here to, to think about this. So first, you know, it has, as I described, like the right dynamic of a bubble. In the boom phase, we have like high disagreement, 
prices are going to be high and we're going to observe also high entry or high innovation in the economy, which is followed by a bust phase at period one where output turns out to be below market expectations, right? Because output is distributed according to F. And so we're going to observe a price correction at day 12. Yeah. So this is a, a relevant, especially relevant model to us because we think that, uh, thanks, Danny. Uh, innovation and bubble, uh, we have, with innovation and bubbles, you know, when there is lots of new ideas around, like investors tend to rely more on the priors and actually will observe more differences of opinion. Okay, so that's one thing that really think captured the fact that innovations and bubbles are tied together. And then there are two uh, uh, of salient features uh, of bubbles that we reproduce. First, there is static overvaluation that I uh, discussed earlier. So everybody agrees that the index is overpriced. And second, in the paper, we actually show how we can uh, obtain easily dynamic overvaluation that everybody thinks every firm is overpriced. Okay, so let me uh, talk in the time that I've left about how we think about the value of innovation in this context. Okay, so to measure innovation, we're gonna separate private from social value. Private value is really how much the firm is bringing me, the investor. How much is a new firm producing for its owner? Okay, you can measure this using either ex post profits or the market price of the firm. We're gonna call this V of M. The social value is like how much is a firm bringing to the whole economy? How much is the firm changing the economy, right? So this affects not only Introducing a new firm to the economy only brings not only brings the value of that firm, but also we have to consider the impact on that of that firm on all the other firms in the economy. Okay, so that the social value is going to be done by the derivative uh, with respect to ME when I add a new firm of the total value in the economy. Now to think about spillovers, right? So how does uh, the private value differ from the social value? We're gonna look at the distance, the relative distance of those two objects with respect to the private value. And it turns out that uh, this, it is naturally equal to the elasticity of firm value with respect to firm entry here, okay? So the one thing that we need to think about is like when we think about private value, there are two different ways of measuring it. We could either use the market-based measure, as I said, so like using uh, financial markets where, where we know that the value of a firm is going to be high because of the bubble, or we could use just the outcome-based measure where we have seen no commensurate increase, right? There is nothing that tells us that outcome is going to be higher just because uh, there is, we are in a bubble. And so I'm going to show you results of spillovers given those two types of measure. First, I'm going to start with the easier one, which is outcome-based spillover. So here, again, I'm going to measure private value and uh, social value using the real outcomes. And it turns out that, so like the spillover using real outcome is equal to the uh, a size of profits displaced. So those are the firms that are impacted by adding a new firms, right? This is how much profits we're gonna lose from this business stealing from this uh, excess competition scaled by the total or the average number of profits earned. And here what's important what you can see is that it's evaluated using the aggregate distribution, okay? Turns out that business stealing as expected is a negative spillover. This is sort of like a negative number here, right? Bringing a new firm is bad for the uh, uh, other firms in the economy. And, you know, due to some uh, assumptions we made, this does actually does not depend on the number of firms in the economy. And now if I move to market-based spillover, so measuring uh, the spillover using financial markets using uh, market valuations, well, I need to evaluate the uh, spillover using the valuation of those spillovers from the people who receive the spillover. So using the actual beliefs of the households. So that's going to be, again, my profit displaced by other, that's my valuation under the uh, uh, favorite distribution scale by what I expect to gain uh, 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 on average, if I have a firm that en enter, right? My profits are, okay? So the implications from this is that first, market-based and outcome-based spillover coincide without disagreement. When N is equal to one, and there is no speculation of financial markets, outcome spillover and market-based spillover give me the same result. The second thing and then that I, will, I want to get back to is that speculation tends to dampen the intensity 
of market-based development. Let me uh, uh, explain this a little bit. What happens is that speculation increases the distance between the marginal and the average active firm, right? If you know that you are picking the best firm among, let's say, 10, 100 of uh, candidates, right? You think that it's unlikely that you are going to be the one firm that gets displaced, right? And so that's going to introduce a large distance between the marginal firm, the firm that's going to get displaced, and the average firm that you think you pick, right? So another way of saying this more technically is that means that I'm shifting probabilities to the right, and the uh, uh, and and fn prime over f prime has like the monotone likelihood ratio property. All right, so let me actually skip this and, and show you a little bit of like how you could implement this uh, uh, in the data before I, I, when I conclude. Okay, so first, you know, what we showed that the market value of innovation increases with bubbles, not only in absolute terms, but also relative to actual outcome. Second, the market-based measure of spillover to competitors is smaller in bubbles, but the outcome-based measure is unchanged in bubbles, okay? So this competition spillover disappears in times of bubbles only when measured using market value of spillover. How do we implement this? Well, we're gonna actually have to do two things. We're gonna have to think about how we measure private versus uh, uh, social value and then how we uh, capture market versus outcome-based uh, valuation. Okay, so first, to answer the question, does private value of innovation increase in bubbles? Well, we're going to rely on Kogan et al. Uh, that used the universe of patents from the US uh, until 2010 and think about the private value of a patent about as the change in the stock price around a patent issuance uh, versus the, the outcome value of a patent as the scientific value of the patent. You can think of like the forward number uh, of citation. Okay. To think about bubbles, we're going to identify bubbles relying on uh, Greenwood et al. Uh, uh, and basically, we're going to think of like a bubble in an industry month as uh, an industry that's experienced like high uh, and fast price rise in the last uh, two years. Okay, so let me just uh, show you the first result. The first result, we're going to so like look on the left hand side at uh, the private value of a patent, so that's the change in the stock market around a patent being granted either uh, observed at the patent level or at the firm level, we're going to request this on a bubble dummy. And so what we find is that, you know, the value of patents is actually higher in a bubble uh, than uh, otherwise. And this is actually true even uh, uh, controlling for either the fact that, you know, the, the price rise that we experience, so like log market cap, and also controlling for the number of citations going forward. Okay, so that really suggests that you know, uh, patents are indeed more valuable in bubbles. Uh, and, and the numbers here tell us that patents are actually 30 to 50% more valuable in bubbles than, than otherwise. Okay, so it really tells us that bubble is not like something uh, completely crazy happens to innovation. There is really something special at bubbles uh, and innovation. The second thing and last thing I want to talk about is like, how can we think about measuring social value? Okay, so Bloom, Shankerman, Van Rinen actually tell us something about this, but think about exposure to technology and competition uh, related to like the closeness of other firms or other patents. And we're gonna use, again, the stock market to think about private value and sales to think about, uh, uh, sorry, the stock market to think about market-based measure and uh, output to think, sales to think about output-based uh, uh, measures. And what we're, we're going to look at, we're going to actually reproduce uh, uh, their uh, specification, but what we're going to think about, we're going to try to see whether their measure of competition spillover is changed when we interact uh, the competition spillover with the uh, bubble time, okay? And so the standard, like Bloom, Schoenkerman, Van Rinen results that, you know, competition, uh, business stealing is actually uh, a force. What we find is that you know, the interaction with bubble is positive. That means that there is really sort of like a strong dampening of uh, uh, bubbles when I think about uh, competition spillover, but that dampening is only there when I focus on the market-based value of innovation. And it's actually doesn't show up here when I focus about the outcome-based uh, value of innovation. That's really sort of like gives credence to, to our theory that there's something about bubbles that 
affects how we perceive innovation in really uh, strong ways. I think, Tony, I'm probably out of time. So I wish I could sort of like talk to you uh, more about like how we can incorporate richer sources of spillover, but I'm just gonna uh, skip to the conclusion. Uh, what we really want to highlight is that there is sort of like a method to the madness of bubbles. Now like bubbles, you know, there are times where things are crazy and exuberant, but you know, we can actually make sense of what happens on financial markets and innovations uh, uh, together uh, uh, to think a bit more seriously about it. Thank you.